weekly learning session. My name is Carlos Navia. We do this every Wednesday at 6 p.m. Eastern time, 3 p.m. Pacific time. Um, I don't know if they've been doing the live feed on Facebook. I know we have some issues with that from time to time, but if you follow LBS on Facebook, they probably gave you the link and that's how you ended up here to get here in the first place. So I have been a professional bartender for 20 plus years now in many, many states. I even ran a bar in Mexico for a while which is where I met my life, wife who lives with me here in San Luis Obispo, California. I have been training bartenders for local bartending school for about eight years now. Started doing it in Florida before I moved back to California, continued to do it since. So I do this every week, I do one-on-ones. I have not seen anyone in person since COVID. Everyone has been on Zoom, which is kind of fine. I think we've all learned you know, how to do it at this point. Um, so I am here in part smoke and part cloud today here in California. But outside the Tiki Bar, it's still nice, not too bad, still 70 degrees, so it's not too bad out here. A little rain, a little smoky rain this morning. Um, uh, Going to mention again, Tales of the Cocktail that's coming up September 20th to 23rd. If you go to talesofthecocktail.org, you can register for that. It is 100% free. I did download the app today and register and kind of poke around at some of the conferences and things that were happening there. Um, there were a good 500 plus people on there already when I was on the app earlier today, just kind of talking and mingling and, you know, kind of getting to know each other and making new friends. So it really is a great opportunity to get more information, as well as an opportunity to kind of, you know, commune and, um, you know, make new acquaintances and meet bartenders from all around the world. And, you know, you're sure to meet someone in there you have something in common with and learn some stuff and have some fun in there. So actually, I might have it open if I have a picture of it. And I might not. No, it's not going to work the way I intended it to. So we'll stop that. Okay. So we'll hope I can get the pictures I want later. So one of the things I want to talk about that I saw, though, and let me see if I can find this picture, if I can do this correctly and not screw up my Zoom, is I was in the grocery store, and I happened to notice that they had some adult kind of like otter pops that they're making now these frozen pops here um, that are flavored with alcohol in them that are kind of like otter pops you have when you're a kid you know doesn't look very summery out here today but it looked like a fun fun summer treat that we had here bud light seltzers making these five percent alcohol 100 calories a pop um, looked very cool by the beach by the pool they make cool tie-dye color i guess is a limited edition i don't know hippie throwback tie-dye colors but the other ones I saw that I thought were really interesting were these guys here. If you guys don't know Cutwater, they make uh, cans of Moscow Mule, margarita, stuff like that, basically stuff already mixed in the can. Well, they've done the same thing now with popsicles. So you can have a Moscow Mule popsicle or you can have a margarita popsicle, anything like that, which I thought was cool as well. Truly's also making some, um, you know, with their hard seltzer flavors or their hard lemonade flavors. But this one I saw, and I, I want to kind of find these if I can, but they looked really expensive. So I don't know if anybody remembers push-ups, uh, kind of an ice cream, and you'd push it up from the bottom and just kind of eat it. And as you ate it, you would push more up through it. Well, they're making these now, Buzz Pops. Uh, all kinds of different flavors, 10 to 15% alcohol. Um, looked very cool. I would love to try them. But in the article I saw them in, I believe it said that they were charging $75 for a 12 pack Jeez. of these, which seems quite high. I was like, I got to find something. I'm like, well, maybe, maybe I could make something of my own at home for less than that. Um, I'm sure I could find a, a popsicle mold or something, uh, you know, and, and figure out my own way to make something like that because that seems a little exorbitant or something but they looked like a cool thing they looked like a fun thing to have for the summer you know summer's not quite over yet um my only kind of question my only concern is i don't know if anybody else remembers eating otter pops but they kind of have some shanks on the edge of them and you end up with otter pop sores in the corner of your mouth and I'm just wondering if they figured out a way around that, because that would be the killing point on those, like right away, you know, the Buzz Pops, the cut water cocktails would not be so fun if they were doing that, just like the Otter Pops used to do to, you know, back in the day. So I just wanted to kind of share those and anybody's interested in those, go check those out. Or if anybody's tried those, let me know, send me a shot on Facebook or something. Let me know how they are, because I haven't tried them yet. Um, I realized that I haven't really ever talked about beer on a Wednesday, which is odd because I love beer. 
I used to drink quite a bit of beer. I have a beer fridge that I can reach without getting out of my bed. Um, although it doesn't have a lot of beer in it anymore, not like it used to. Um, you know, it, it, it's it's kind of always been my thing. I've always been into it. You know, my first real job when I was 16, a junior in high school, was beer van guy at a water park in Southern California. Um, and I only got that position by relentlessly badgering my boss into letting me do it one day. Because uh, I wasn't 18, I wasn't supposed to do it, but I would just, you know, I look 18, I would just badger him. Well, counting money in the morning and counting money in the evening, he pretty much just had to listen to me for 20 to 30 minutes, badger him continuously. When am I going to work the beer van? You're not old enough to work the beer van. I pour beer in other, in other bars, though. I pour beer in other stands. You're not old enough to work the beer van. But I look like I'm 18. You're not old enough to work the beer van. When are you going to let me work the beer van? This went on for a couple of weeks. Finally, he gave me a chance to be beer van guy. I sat in front of a Bud Light van pouring beer. The Beach Boys played behind me in a pit. I made $125, I think, which was great for a 16 year old because the rest of my friends bagged groceries. And that became my position. You know, junior high school, my job was beer van guy. So I really always loved beer, always had an affinity for it. You know, I used to work at a place in Southern California called the Beer Hunter. And at the time, served 175 different beers. You know, at the time, these people actually ordered, uh, opened. I think four or five different locations that all kind of looked like this, you know, 50, 60 TVs, pool tables, 35, 40 beers on tap, good bar food, stuff like that. Now, eventually they sold it off. Um, I don't think they managed it into the quite the uh, Buffalo Wild Wings corporate system they were going for. Ended up selling all but the original restaurant, um, which is still there in La Quinta and still the Beer Hunter to this day. If anybody ever goes to La Quinta, California, you're welcome to stop by the Beer Hunter and check it out. They've got a lot of great, great stuff. But I learned a lot about beer, you know, working there. And one of the best things about it was I got to try a lot of different beers. Um, you know, that was quite a while ago. I can't say I really remember how every one of them tasted because I would just try a different beer, you know, every day kind of after work. But you know, the beer landscape has really honestly even changed a lot since then. Um, you know, two, two big companies kind of kind of changed everything for, for everybody. Um, for a long time, you know, it was the macro brews, it was the Budweiser, Coors, Miller. Um, coincidentally, none of which are owned by American Interest anymore. Uh, they're all owned by European companies now, so they're really not even American beers anymore, which is kind of odd. <clears throat> but you know, Beer goes back basically to nomadic tribes that figured out that how to ferment, you know, different grains and barleys and stuff that they would find. Um, and then it was a big part, you know, different kinds of ancient cultures. Um, Babylonians had, I think, 20 different recipes for beer. Um, you know, what I also think is funny is, you know, at that time back then, uh, people would only drink beer and not water. Because if you drank the water, you would get dysentery and die. But if you drank the beer, you would be fine. Now, eventually, people figured out by boiling the water, you get rid of the bacteria that causes the dysentery. Um, I'm not going to say they understood what dysentery is. In fact, I'm not going to lie and say that I really know what dysentery is, but <laughs> I know it'll kill you if you find it in the water. So eventually, figured out through the boiling process of making the beer, they were getting out the contaminants, and they figured out you could just boil the water and drink the water. But up till that time, it was a thing. Drink water. You want to die? Have a beer. Come on. Well, what's wrong with you? Are you, are you, are you know, you crazy. Um, you know, pharaohs in ancient Egypt were buried with, you know, uh, containers of beer um, for the afterlife when they woke up and got to walk around again. So they have plenty of beer. And in fact, even, you know, the, the workers that built the pyramids were even paid in beer at that time. So it's always kind of been a big part of society. You know, we got into um, get into like the prohibition period where beers kind of lightened up and we started to get you know kind of the american beers we think of our budweiser Coors, miller stuff like that um also not coincidentally that's really where the modern kind of mixologist came from as well because the alcohols that people get it were getting tasted so bad you know pre-prohibition a lot of times you'd drink straight spirits not add too much to them but once prohibition came and people were you know getting what they call bathtub gin which was literally made in people's bathtubs and then bottled and served to people. They needed to kind of cover up and mask the taste of the crappy alcohol. 
Um, you know, of course, the people are still going to drink. We're still going to get a buzz. But, you know, they needed some juices to cover it up and stuff like that. What's funny is like the new trend now and what, what I should say new trend, but what Tales of the Cocktail talks about a lot of times now, too, is uh, their big movement is, you know, drink better, not more. You know, you can have a couple of really good cocktails and still get a nice buzz and enjoy yourself instead of just drinking a bunch of crappy stuff. Um, you know, a lot of crappy stuff. Uh, it's kind of funny, you know, I used to drink a lot of beer. I don't that much anymore. But I would always be like, well, it's Miller Lite. It's only 96 calories. Well, yeah, but when you drink 20 of them a day, that's still a lot of calories. That's still adding up a lot. Whereas, you know, if I have two or three, you know, some of these stronger beers that they have around here today, does me just fine. That's plenty good. Not as many calories. Uh, keeps the, the weight off in my older years. Um, sorry, I forgot where it was. But, you know, get the lighter beers. But then in the, I guess, the early 70s, two companies kind of changed the landscape. So Sierra Nevada out here in California and uh, Boston Brewing Company, which makes Sam Adams. Sierra Nevada and Sam Adams were the first two to really kind of gain a national reputation um, and not just the local following uh, as far as, you know, craft beers or what they consider, you know, microbreweries, um, which I know neither of them are kind of microbreweries now. They're both really big breweries at this point, but they changed the landscape and they opened it up for, you know, people to start making beer in small batches of microbreweries and becoming popular and being able to sell it, you know, all over the country. Um, where I live here, there's Mike coming in. Where I live here in Central California, we have a beer company called Firestone Walker, if I can find their picture. And they make a beer called 805, which is actually the area code here for the location I live in. <clears throat> now, pretty recently, within the last, I think, about five years, 805 has been picked up nationally. Um, you can buy it as far as New York. Um, you might see it where you live around. It comes from here in the Central Coast, a place called Paso Robles. Weird thing about 805 is it, it's been around for a long time, but it just grew in popularity kind of recently in the past five or 10 years. And the reason being this label, this branding. Um, you know, prior to that, it was called Firestone Walker Honey Blonde Ale. And all they did was change the name, put a really cool logo on it with the area code of the place we live in. And now it's become super popular. It's like the Bud Light of the Central Coast here. So it's, it's weird how that quick change and that quick rebrand. I even have the sticker on my truck. If you go buy a 12 pack, you get the 805 sticker in there, every 12 pack. So in my town, they're just laying around everywhere. People just have them laying around their house. Um, it's just pretty normal. Um, you know, but that simple rebranding just allowed them to go national and really get you know, like a national following just by kind of changing it up and making it a little different there. So when we talk about how beer is made, um, we're going to take barley and malt the barley. And basically what I mean by malting is they put it on the floor, they expose it to some warm water and a bunch of humidity, and it, um, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> it starts to, uh, if I can find the word, I can't find the word. Um, why, am I, why am I not finding the word? Oh, it starts to germinate. Thank you. It starts to grow a little. It starts to germinate. Um, doing that is going to help basically turn the grains into sugars. Then when we add the yeast to is gonna process it, turns it into alcohol, turns it into carbonation. You know, when they add the hops, that's gonna give it flavor. I had to kind of look you know, like, what exactly are hops? Um, you know, vine-like plant um, with a cluster of seeds in the cones. They have the little cones that come out. There's little yellow seeds in there. They're looking for a chemical they, they call lupulin, which are tiny little yellow pods that are inside there. That's going to give the beer kind of the bitterness and the flavor to it and the hoppiness. And, you know, depending on where the hops come from, just like grapes, they're going to have a different flavor. Where are they grown? What climate are they grown in? You know, what kind of soil are they grown in? And, you know, what kind of nutrients and stuff are they put in the soil to help the stuff grow? So they're all going to have different flavors, which is going to give the beer different flavors, depending on what kind of hops you use. Um, you know, then, of course, there's water, which is pretty much about 90% of what beer is. So what kind of water you pick to make the beer is going to be important as well. You know, as far as the purity of the water and the softness doesn't have any kind of... Um, uh, what do you call things in hard water? Sediments, um, minerals, stuff like that in the water that's going to affect the beer, it's going to affect the taste of the beer. So we malt the barley, we let it start to germinate, we take it into a mash stage where they just add water to it and start to heat it up. Um, then they filter all that out 
and they start to boil what's remaining, the liquid that's remaining. <clears throat> that's called the wort, which I knew that one. At this point, you can add the hops, you know, you can add it at the beginning of the boil, you can have it add it at the end of the boil. It just kind of depends on what you're going for and what kind of beer you're making. Um, the wort is cooled down, the yeast is added, and then it allows it to ferment. Um, from there, you're going to put it in whatever kind of container you're going to put it in, a bottle or barrels to age it or cans or whatever you're going to do with it. End result is you end up with beer when you're done with all that. Now, we have different kinds of beer and a bunch of different ones. Before I go through these, when it comes to when it comes down to pouring a beer, you know, when we're, when we're pouring a tap beer, just a couple of things to remember when it really comes to pouring the tap beer. And you know, you might be using any one of these kinds of different glasses or some of your nicer, um, really good Belgian beers and stuff like that will come in a goblet or, um, you know, a goblet or some kind of specialty glass, things like Chimay, Duvel, um, some really good ones like that. There's a Canadian one called Le Fin de Monde, which is excellent too. Um, which literally translates to end of the world, about 9% alcohol, excellent, excellent stuff. Um, when you go to pour it from the tap, please don't hit the glass on the tap. You should never hear a tinking sound, a tinking sound, like there's a chance to chip the glass, but it just sounds bad, it looks bad. You don't ever have to bring the glass that close to the tap itself. The tap should never be in the glass. It should never be inside the beer. You can hold it six inches away at a tilt, open that tap up, let it hit the side of the glass. It's not gonna foam up any more than if you stick it right up against the tap. Um, you know, I used to, it, ah, it's a big pet peeve if you can't see me getting agitated. Um, you put that tap into my beer, that's disgusting, okay? I used to have a boss that called it snorkeling. And what happens is every time that tap goes into beer, more foam sticks around the end of it, all right? And then it gets dirty. And then you stick it in another glass and more foam sticks there and it gets dirty. And what happens is the same people that do that are the same people that never wipe those taps off. And they get disgusting and they get nasty and they get dirty. Um, you know, I, I've seen this, I've done this in places and I've seen it on Bar Rescue too. That's where I actually got it from. But I've seen people do it a long time before that actually. You can go to a lot of places, take a white bar napkin, wad it up, stick it inside the tap and pull it out and see what's in there. Um, fair warning though, you can't unsee what's in there. Like once you've seen what a lot of taps look like and how disgusting they are, you, you'll never want to drink tap beer again. You'll only like go for bottles ever and ever again. Um, you know, it is the job of your distributor to come and clean your tap lines out to make sure that they are clean and that's not happening. Uh, they are supposed to do it once a month. If you have their handle on their label, they're responsible for that line and they should be doing it. I know where I live now here that that doesn't happen a whole lot. Um, one of the places I worked at the country club here, we had eight lines and four of them were the same company and they only, they were the only four that got cleaned. At one point, I finally made the suggestion that we just change the four tap handles every month so that they would clean four lines one month and then clean four lines the other month. And we just wouldn't tell them that they were cleaning all eight lines, uh, which we did and <laughs> it worked out pretty well, but they should be the ones doing it still. They make little scrub brushes. You can get in there and scrub it out. You can wipe it out, run a little beer to get all that stuff out of there and clean them up and make sure they're good and keep them from getting nasty by not putting them into people's beers. You can hold it six inches away. It's just fine. It's not making the beer foam up more. 90 degree angle till it gets about three quarters full. Then you just set it down and top it off. You should have some head on there, at least a quarter of an inch. Um, you know, when I first started pouring beer and I was 16, I always thought, well, that's kind of wasting space. That could be beer that I could have. But what happens is if you don't put some head on there, people think it's flat, whether it is or whether it isn't. So put a little bit of head there on there, put a little quarter inch on there at least to make it look nice, make it look like it's carbonated, make it look like it's foamy. Um, another thing, and I'm surprised I have, I'm surprised I ran into people that do not realize this. If you're working with tap beer, dealing with tap beer, uh, kegs have to be kept cold, okay? You cannot leave kegs out at room temperature. If they get above 40 degrees, they will spoil and they will be disgusting and it'll be a bad cat. Um, very surprised that I've seen that done and a lot of people don't know that. Um, I used to have kids in high school argue with me about it, saying we drive by the water park and we could see them sitting outside. I'm like, those are the empties. I'm like, I'm the one that does, it's my job. What do you think? I don't know, why would you think by driving by? You know more than I do, I pour it for a living. Um, you know, so it's funny, keep them cold. 
you cannot let it get above 40 degrees. It will spoil, it will make it disgusting. The other kind of tap you run into that's a little bit different though is if you have Guinness and if you have real Guinness on tap. Because Guinness is pumped with nitrogen and it builds instead of just um, the CO2 that the regular beer is pumped with, it kind of has a little different weight to it. And by I say build, when you put it in the glass, it'll be gray, you'll see stuff moving. Eventually it'll turn black all the way up to the top. So when I go to pour Guinness, you don't even really have to tilt the glass. You can if you want to. The thing about a Guinness tap is it goes forward 90 degrees. It com goes forward 90 degrees. It comes backwards at 90 degrees. So it has 180 degree range of motion. Pull it all the way forward 90 degrees. Put the cup under there. Fill it three quarters. Turn it off. Let it sit there for 90 seconds. It's going to take a little while for it to build up and for the whole thing to turn black. But you want to wait for the whole thing to turn black before you top it off. People that drink Guinness know this. People that drink Guinness are going to wait for it. When I used to drink Guinness, I would start to order another one when I got that way far down on this one so that I knew it would be ready by the time I finished this. One. So people know, take your time, let it build up. It'll have a nice, creamy, thick head on it at that point. At that point, I can take it, push the hat, tap handle slightly back, and just let a little bit out to top off the Guinness. Now, if you want to get really, really creative, you can push it back, a little bit will come out, and because you have a thick foamy head on the top, you can kind of make designs. Uh, if you do a figure eight and then come back and have, do half of another figure eight, you can make a little clover leaf on top. Um, I can make all kinds of weird things that I won't mention on this show, um, depending on who comes to my bar. But you can have some fun with it, write some stuff on it, make some cool designs on it, stuff like that. So if you are working with Guinness, that is the right way. That is the right way to pour it. Guinness is very, very good if poured correctly. Um, I'm gonna grab some powering. Yeah, a little shamrock on top. Yep, yep, and it looks very cool. You know, I've seen some people try to do some other things too, like drip some green cream to mint or something on there, which I don't really like on the Guinness. Irish coffee though, you put the whipped cream on the Irish coffee. If you come back and drip a little cream to mint on there, that's a nice touch. Though. Looks very cool um, as well as, you know, not really affecting the drink. Maybe it's gonna give it a little bit of minty flavor, which is not really gonna hurt it at all. <laughs> Worst Irish coffee story ever. <laughs> woman came back up with two Irish coffees, looked at me and said, I can taste that this is not decaffeinated coffee you used in these two Irish coffees. And first of all, caffeine has no flavor, so you can't taste it, number one. Um, second of all, even if it did have a flavor, there is still caffeine in decaffeinated coffee. So you would still taste it in there anyway. Number three, there's no way you could taste it, even if you could, over Bailey's whiskey and whipped cream. So I just thought I'd share that because that popped into my head as I got on the Irish coffee. So <laughs> um, lager beers, and that's what we think about a lot here in the United States, what we consider, you know, most of our beers, your Budweiser, you know, your quarters, stuff like that are gonna be lagers, light lagers, pale and golden color, light in body, flavor with medium to light hops, taste, and are fairly highly carbonated, generally have a soft, mellow, low, dry taste. Um, you know, Pilsner is the big one. Um, I don't think they see dormant or round anymore. They're all Pilsners. These are all Pilsner glasses. That's what we kind of call them as well. You know, there's some other different Vienna style ones, has an amber color. Munich has a dark lager that the Germans drink there, much different from what we consider a lager here. Um, you know, you got your ales. Um, higher in percentage of alcohol extracted from extracted higher percentage of alcohol than extracted from lagers, a little more aromatic, full bodied, um, pronounced flavor and tartness, you know, cream ales and sparkling ales are what you're going to find different types of those. And you see a lot of these companies out now too. uh, these micro brews of these smaller, you know, ones that are coming out, going to some traditional types of ales and using traditional methods and recipes that they found that are, you know, one recipe that they found was 4,000 years old, etched into a poem in stone. Um, I think Dogfish is actually doing that exact recipe uh, the way it was written, you know, almost 4,000 years ago. So it's cool that you can kind of find some of these now if you look around, that there's really great cool stuff coming out. You know, stouts and porters, stouts have a dark color, almost black, real thick in some of them, rich multi-flavor. Um, 
you know, strong bitter taste, uh, strong bitter hop taste and a high alcohol content, usually low to medium carbonation. Porters originated in England in 1722. Um, to satisfy public demand, I don't want to read this word for word. The heavy beverage, but more lightly brewed today, has a more bitter and dry taste than in the 18th century. Porter is made with charcoal or colored malt, which gives it the dark brown kind of color and flavor to it. Um, this book that I'm actually reading from, which is an old book from the Beer Hunter uh, that I'm referring to, uh, talks about malt liquor, which I think is kind of funny because back in the days when I started pouring beer when I was 16, that was definitely a big thing in California where I lived and where I grew up. Um, you know, Mickey's malt liquor still makes an appearance at my house from time to time. Uh, he, he has come over. Uh, no more old English 800. That was definitely more a 90s thing. I don't think that's, uh, I'm sure it's still around, but I don't see it around much anymore. Um, and I, there were other malt liquors of the time, but I won't go too, too deep into those and uh, my childhood and upbringing. You know, light beers came out in the 60s. True light and dry beers became possible because of the development of commercial availability of an enzyme called, and I'm going to try to pronounce this, amyloglucidase. Okay, so it just gave them another brewing process where they could do it without um, all the calories and without um, and with a different way of fermenting the sugars in the yeast using this chemical. Um, you know, you see a lot of light beers out. I don't think you see a lot of dry beers. Uh, I guess that was back in the 90s too. Bud came out with Bud Dry and that was a thing for a year or two, but I think that was, uh, that, that, that fell out of favor pretty quickly. It wasn't very good. I tried it. Um, I don't think anyone drank it. Um, so two lighter dry beers has fewer calories, no carbohydrates, and a much intoxicating effect is regular beer. There's less body because the dextrin are no longer there. Uh, this loss of flavor and aroma can be avoided to a great degree by the beverages using high quality ingredients, such as making brew with characters sufficient to stand out, even a diluted to reduce alcohol. Um, so you see a lot of beers out there. Like I said, Miller Lite, the original, my favorite, 96 calories. He still visits once in a while around here. <clears throat> Other kind of beers you run into, wheat beers or white beers or Belgian wit, a lot of times people will call those. Um, you know, Hefeweizens were big when I worked at the Beer Hunter, Pyramid Hefeweizen, I forget there were some other companies that were making it. They were very popular. Squeeze an orange or a lemon in there, you know, give it a little bit of citrus flavor. Um, I eventually had to lay off the Hefeweizens when I found out how many calories were in each pint. Um, let's just say it's a lot more than Miller Lite. Um, <laughs> probably five, six times more than Miller Lite in most pints of Heverizon. Um, you know, good wheat beers. The other one you see Belgium wit a lot. And of course there's one that's real popular here made by the Coors company called Blue Moon, which you probably see around a lot of places. Uh, it's made in Colorado. It's not a Belgian beer. It says Belgian style white beer right on there. Style being the key word, um, but you know, still kind of made in the traditional way that they made, you know, the Belgian wheat beers for a very long time. Um, you know, you got your brown ales, which are kind of, I shouldn't say making a comeback, but, um, you know, popular in California. Uh, there's a couple, one called Davy Brown, one called Downtown Brown that are real popular from some LA breweries that are down there. You know, um, deep copper brown color, dry sweet maltness dominated with very little hop flavor or aroma. Fruity and buttery flavors are appropriate. Yeah, not very hoppy, really smooth, dark, good flavor to them. And of course, what's all the rage around here is IPAs, IPAs, Indian Pale Ales. Indian Pale Ale has a high alcohol content, high hoppy rate. This pale, deep color, deep copper colored ale has a full flowery hop aroma. The use of high water mineral contents contribute to the dry flavor of the beer. IPAs are characterized by medium maltness. So that's a traditional IPA, but what we have around here a lot are, um, oh God, what do they call them? West Coast style IPAs. I think that the main characteristic in that is they have a little bit of fruitiness to them. Um, you know, you get some fruit flavors and some other things in there. So they're a little sweeter and a little lighter than a traditional IPA would be. Um, you know, the new kind of trend that's very recent is hazy IPAs or unfiltered IPAs. Let me see if I got a picture of this guy. There he is. So something like this guy, this is made for, by the same company that makes 805, Mind Haze IPA. Really hazy color because they're not filtering out everything um, like they are with the regular IPAs and with the regular beers. So 
um, you know, regular gold and amber color, but you can't see through it. It's like opaque. It's not clear and golden. So becoming a new trend, kind of the big thing. The other thing is that they have around here where I live in California, a lot of is called double IPAs. And when you run into guys like this that are 9% or higher alcohol, you know, beware. This is actually their double IP that's hazy as well, that's unfiltered. I think this one's 9.2%, um, you know, compared to a Miller Lite that I only think is about 4 or 5%, you know, that I usually drink. So it, do, it doesn't take a whole lot of those uh, or something like that to get you going, kind of what I was talking about. Um, there's one out here called Lizard Mouth. I didn't get the picture of it. You know, just beware. Um, you forget that they're not your regular IPA, you forget that it's not your regular beer, they do sneak up on you pretty quick when it comes to those double IPAs. You know, got American Pale Ales, and that's kind of what I was talking about there, although there are some other ones that are made which are very popular, Sierra Nevada, of course, which I mentioned earlier, being one of those. National Bitters, Scottish Ales, Blonde Ales, like I just mentioned, the, uh, you know, 805, the Honey Blonde Ale, you know, Golden Ales, Pale Blonde by Pale blonde variations of a classic pale ale. However, golden ales more closely approximate a, lar a lager in its crisp dry palate. Noticeable floral aromas and light body. Um, you know, blonde ales, light ales, I guess, like it says, kind of resembles a lager or a pilsner. Really easy drinking. I like that 805, the Bud Light of the Central Coast here. You see some Kolsch's around sometimes. I don't see a lot of them. And warm ferment, aged in cold temperatures. Pale color, slightly dry. Subtle sweet palette. Um, I'm trying to think of the brand name. I know there's a couple you see um, that are still around, but I can't think of their names right now. Porters are talked about a little and stouts as well. Um, <laughs> mentioned strong ales, Old English, which is what Old English is supposed to resemble. Um, barley wine, and I think that's becoming popular again now too. Barley wines mead, stuff like that is also the kind of a trend that's going on, I think, in New York and California as well. You will see those around. Those are becoming, becoming very popular. You know, it talks a little bit about spice beers. I won't go into that. Bachs are around there. There's a couple, you know, Amber Bach is still popular. If you live down in Texas, Shiner Bach is still popular. Strong malty, bottom fermented beer with moderate hop bitterness that should increase proportionately with the starting gravity. You know, can range in color. Most of them are deep and dark. Um, I like a good Bach beer. I think it's excellent as well. Doppelbox, I don't see a lot of those around anymore. You know, Amber Ales, Dark Lagers. I'm not gonna read this word for word and go into them. American Light Lagers, I talked a little about. Dry Lagers, American Malt Liquor, Mickey's, bless its heart. And your German Wit beers, you know, and your Belgium Wit as well, your wheat beers that you're gonna have and come into contact with. You know, the other thing when it kind of comes to beer, and storing the beer, like I talked when about the kegs, is to make sure that beer is not stored in, in sunlight. Um, you know, you can skunk a beer, which just means it's exposed to the light and the light will change the flavor of the beer. Uh, you know, the reason it's put into green and brown bottles is to stop the light so that the light won't hit it and destroy it. And, um, you know, what they call light starching. Um, you know, destroying the beer. Um, if you've ever got a skunky beer, it is really horrible. Um, there used to be an old Keystone Light commercial of bitter beer face. Um, that is literally the face you will make when you get a nasty or skunked beer like that. You know, that being said, beer in the bottles and cans, as long as it's kept in a cool, dry place, you know, it can keep for a very long time. Um, the fact that it's already carbonated allows it to be kept at a uh, room temperature, whereas the kegs are not. They do not have the pressure in there or the carbonation already in there that's acting as a preservative and maintaining the beer. So I have personally, you know, as long as it's stored properly, if it's stored outside, if it got hot, if it's stored in the sunlight where the sun can hit it, it's going to skunk the beer. It's going to be nasty stuff. But I have personally drank beer that sat in the walk-in cooler of a nightclub while it was closed for a year. So the coolers weren't on, but it was in cases. It was in the cooler. The coolers deep back into the restaurant built into a mountain. And, you know, it stayed at even temperature in the cooler and it wasn't exposed to the light. So we found this beer when someone bought the nightclub and we decided to open it back up and we had to go through this place that had been shut down for a year and, you know, see what we had and work around. Um, you know, we weren't going to sell the beer to the customers, 
because it had been sitting there for a year and we were going to buy a new product. So we asked the distributor, hey, you know, the, this stuff's been sitting in a walk-in cooler for a year that's been turned off. And he said, you know what? If you chill it out, I'll drink the first one. And sure enough, we put ice on it. There was nothing wrong with it. Not skunked, tasted great. A year plus sitting in a cooler with no refrigeration or nothing happening to it. So, you know, as long as it's stored properly, those bottles will keep for a long time. I know now they put born on dates on them, um, which is nice, you know, when your beer was born, you know, the day it was born. And what's what, once again, what your distributors should be doing, um, coming around, checking it and making sure that none of them are too old. Um, I know once again, some distributors in the area, I live better than others about it, but they'll come take the old ones away, replace them with new ones or give you a credit for the old ones that are out of date that they don't want you to serve. And you know, that kind of falls on them and their responsibility as well as, as your distributor to be maintaining their own product. Um, you know, it, it sucks sometimes when you can't get the, these folks to, um, you know, kind of do their jobs properly and actually get the proper people out there to maintain your lines and take the old beer and stuff like that. It's, it's, you know, I live in a small town, we deal with what we deal with. So it's pretty sad how some of them treat people. They'll um, it's, deliver stuff you didn't order. You know, you leave a note for them to pick it up. They don't pick it up after two weeks, you're stuck with it and stuff like that. But, you know, try to get on them, try to get them out there. Um, but do, do your part too to keep the taps clean, you know, make sure you're rotating the beer stock and stuff like that. You know, FIFO, first in, you know, first out. Um, you know, we're not just putting new bottles in front. We're putting the old bottles in the back. We're moving the new ones to the front. We're rotating the stock and make sure that we're always serving a fresh product, you know, when we're putting something out there. So I, I just wanted to talk a little bit about beer and just kind of pouring beer and stuff like that. Um, I know that there's a whole beer section on there as well. Probably goes a little more into in depth uh, than I do, but I will also mention my favorite, favorite, favorite beer. So if anybody, ah, can I full screen that? So this is a Belgian beer. It is pronounced Duvel, I was told when I worked with a Belgian bartender. Say it like devil, but with a U. Uh, it is excellent. Comes with this nice own glass like that. If you ever have a chance, it's pretty expensive for a four pack, but if you ever have a chance, give it a try if you like beer. It is excellent. It is one of my favorite, favorite beers in the Hawaii world. I got to go to World Market and find some here. It's the only place I know where to find it here. But really, really good stuff. Excellent, excellent beer. And one more thing I wanted to share before I tap out here. Oh, yeah. And, you know, breweries are popping up everywhere. You know, um, I think most states probably have some kind of brewery in some form that you can go to and visit and kind of take it in and do a tasting. You know, go do a tasting, get a flight. You know, this is a flight of beer. They're just going to give you several different samples of different stuff. It is, you know, a super popular thing to do where I live in California. And I just know that beer is growing and there are more and more places opening up all over the country in every state. Take some time to go to a brewery one day check it out, see how stuff is done, you know, see it firsthand, taste some of the beers they have and get to know just some different kinds of beer and different kinds of stuff and products that they're putting out on the market today. Um, and especially in your own town, you know, you have a chance to go to a local place and suggest local things for folks that are coming into your town or for regulars that you have in the bar. In most places, I know they do it here. If I go to a brewery or I go to a winery here and tell them that I work in the industry, they will give me free tastings because it behooves them. You know, can I, if I can get bartenders and servers to taste my product and suggest and recommend my product to people that are coming to this area, that is worth a free tasting. So, you know, you can always reach out to some of these places and contact them and see if they can do something for you as far as a free tasting or some samples or something like that. Most of the time they're willing to do it as well as, you know, coasters, signs, stuff like that. If you want to promote their alcohol, if you want to promote their, um, you know, their beer that they're selling, they're usually pretty good about it and be happy to give you some materials, give you some coasters, give you some shirts, signs, stuff to put up or something like that, or some samples or a free tasting, something like that. So that about wraps it up for what I wanted to talk about today. Don't forget to go register for Tales of the Cocktail. I am actually, someone already sent me a message, so I'm going to go check my messages on the app and see who's on there and talking and hanging out today while I do some more work. Um, does anybody have any questions about anything I talked about today or anything else? I think it's more. Yeah. 
All right, then. Thank you, everybody, for showing up today. I do appreciate it. Um, I will see you next week, but I'm not sure from where. It may be from here. It may be from an undisclosed location. Um, I'm not sure where my plans for next week are taking me. Um, you know, I do want to do one more thing while I got some time here. You know, I got my stuff out. I got my toys out. Before we finish up, let's go ahead and throw a drink together. So I'm going to do, I'm going to do a Rob Roy here. So I'm going to do this up. I'm going to go ahead and take my martini glass and chill it. Just a little glass, a little ice in there. I'm gonna put a little water in there. We're gonna let this guy chill. So Rob Roy is simply a Manhattan made with scotch. What I'm gonna do here is what's referred to as a perfect Rob Roy or perfect Manhattan, which, you know, someone asked me for a perfect Manhattan. They're not asking if you make the quintessential Manhattan, the best hand Manhattan ever. What they're asking for is a Manhattan with both sweet and dry vermouth. So I've got some stuff that kind of looks like doers here. So we're going to pretend is actual doers here. I'll throw a little bit of ice in here, out here in my tiki bar. Now, I was always taught to do two parts whiskey to one part sweet vermouth, which I found to work for me, you know, here in California. When I lived in lower Alabama, North Florida, in the deep south, people like things sweeter. It's just a different taste. It's where sweet tea comes from. Um, I have a student in Kentucky, didn't realize there wasn't sweet tea everywhere in the world. No, it stops somewhere in mid Texas about San Antonio um, where we all go to regular tea on this side. So, you know, people like stuff sweeter there I'd automatically just do half sweet vermouth and half whiskey, which is the way I would do it if someone asked for extra sweet. So, but I'm, when I moved back to California, I went back to two parts to one. So I'm gonna do this one, two parts to one. I'm still getting a feel for these new martini glasses I got. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to do an ounce and a half here of my whiskey. Six. Let's see. We'll do three quarters of an ounce here then of my sweet vermouth. And then since it's a perfect Manhattan, I'm going to add some dry vermouth. And that's not dry vermouth. This is actually my dry vermouth bottle. Since it's a perfect Manhattan, I'm going to add a little bit of dry vermouth. But I'm still only going to do a dash, just a couple drops like I do in a regular martini. Boom, just a couple drops, and that's all I need in there. So I'm going to make this one a little sweet and do something that a bartender who actually worked at the Beer Hunter with me named Morza showed me. Um, he had been working there since I was in grade school. I learned a lot from him. He was a very awesome, awesome guy. I'm just going to put a little bit of cherry juice in here to sweeten it up. So just a touch of cherry juice there in my perfect Rob Roy. I grab my bar spoon, I'm gonna give it a nice stir. And a smile, I stir, I'm gonna make a mess. Give it a nice stir, get everything nice and mixed up in there, good. Oh, I almost forgot something. I've seen it done both ways. I've seen people go back and forth on this. If you have bitters, throw in a couple of glasses. Boom, there. Now we're ready to go, wipe this up. And we get a nice stir here going. We're just stirring it, to get it chilled, but not break the ice up in there. So that we're not watering it down as much as we would if we were shaking it up. I'm gonna throw my ice out here. Try not to break another martini glass back here. Set my martini glass down like this, grab my screen, put it in place, and strain my nice Manhattan out there. A little shake. Little more drips out every time. Come back here, garnish it with a cherry. Boop. Always serve it with a napkin. Bam. There is our perfect Rob Roy ready to go. And you're all set. All right. So thank you, everybody, for showing up. I do appreciate it. Um, not sure what the topic's going to be next week because I'm not sure where I'm going to be. And depending on where I am and what I have going on. It may be something that has to do with where I am and what I have going on. Otherwise, if there's no questions, thank you everybody for showing up. Uh, have a great week. Stay safe. And I will see you all next week.